61st Psalm. The psalmist says, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. Aren't you glad he hears and answers prayer? It says, From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings, Selah. For thou, O God, hast heard my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. Thou wilt prolong the king's life and his years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever. O oh, prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. So will I sing praise unto thy name forever that I may daily perform my vows. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for these good testimonies. Our hearts have been blessed. God, I'm thankful for what you do for your people. God, I'm thankful, Lord, that they stood unashamedly and told about the goodness of God in their life. Lord, I'm thankful for these young people you've saved. And God, I'm thankful for you being a God that never forsakes us, being a God that hears and answers prayer. Now, Father, thank you for the good singing as well. God, thank you for allowing us to be in the house of God. Now, help us from the word of God. Lord, speak and then give us ears, ears to hear and hearts to understand. And God, I pray your perfect will be accomplished. Save that one nearest tell and help your people. We'll bless you for it, for it's in the holy name of Jesus we do pray. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention to this psalm of David. David is the king of Israel, and yet he's still pinning down songs of praise unto God. Notice, if you will, his pleading. Verse number 1, he says, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer, for from the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. A lot of people think, well, if I get a certain position, if I have enough money, I won't need anything. Here's David, king of Israel, uh, the champion of Israel, and yet he's still calling on God and depending on God. Uh, what a blessing when you realize... Uh, it's not about you or what you can attain. It's about God and what God can give you. He gives you peace that passes all understanding. We see his pleading. Notice the protection, if you will. In verse 2 again, it says, When my heart is overwhelmed. You ever been overwhelmed? Oh, if you live long enough, you will be. Uh, David said, when I'm overwhelmed, uh, when I'm having to look out for the flock of Israel, uh, when I'm having to face another enemy, another battle, uh, uh, when uh, 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 the enemy is strong against me, uh, when I'm overwhelmed, here's what I do. Uh, he said, lead me to the rock that has higher than I. Aren't you glad we got a rock today, the rock of ages? Uh, aren't you glad uh, he neither slumbers nor sleep? Uh, aren't you glad he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore? Uh, you can depend on uh, the solid rock. His name is Jesus. Uh, he goes on to say, For thou hast been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. Aren't you glad that God will pull you up next to him, hide you under his wings, and even the enemy can't find you there? We see the pleading, we see the protection. Notice his prolonging. Verse number 6, Thou wilt prolong the king's life, and his years as many generations. Uh, aren't you glad uh, uh, living for God has uh, good blessings? Uh, you know, you can, you can tell folks that live for God, hmm, they don't have the wrinkles and the scars that this world has to offer. Hmm. Hey, he not only prolongs our life, like Brother John said, Brother John should have been dead before he even got saved. But God has prolonged our lives, but he's also blessed our lives. Hmm. Isn't it wonderful to have a blessed life today? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't trade it for all the world has to offer to have the peace of God in my heart. Mm -hmm. Notice, though, he mentions uh, some preparation. Look in verse number 7. 
He says, he shall abide, speaking of himself, the king, he shall abide before God forever. Oh, prepare mercy and truth. You know what this world needs a whole lot of? Truth and mercy. Mm -mm. This world is being built upon fabrications and lies, and this world doesn't show much mercy. I'm glad the Lord Jesus Christ is the truth, and I'm glad he came full of grace and mercy. Aren't you? Uh, and hey, aren't you glad he was preparing mercy and truth for you before you even knew he existed, huh? But then notice his preserving. Prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. Truth and mercy will preserve you in this life and the life to come. And then notice, if you will, his praise. So will I sing praise unto thy name forever. You know, that's one thing we can't do enough of is praise the Lord. He is worthy of our praise and he inhabits our praise. That means when we praise him, he just shows up and sits down. But he goes on to say this in verse number 8, that I may daily perform my vows. I'm interested in that last phrase of verse number 8. A vow is a solemn promise made to God. Matter of fact, the Bible says it'd be better not to make a vow than to make one to God and break it. It's a solemn promise to God. Can I say that there are vows of devotion where you devote your life unto God? There are vows of abstinence where you abstain from things. And then there are vows of destruction. Hmm? There were times when God would tell the king, go and destroy. And when the king went and destroyed, they had the blessings of God. But when there were kings like Saul who didn't destroy, judgment came. There were vows of destruction. I got to thinking about how folks started making vows yesterday for this whole year. Hmm? And it's amazing, most of them will break them by the end of the week. Hmm? Uh, some of you already broke that diet you started. Hmm? I'm going to do better this year. No, you won't. Why do you think all the, the workout places have these specials the 1st of January? Zero down, $10 a month. Yeah, you'll go three times. Hmm? I'm going to preach with God's help, though, on this thought. Spiritual New Year's resolutions. There are some spiritual vows we ought to make to God, we ought to be concerned about, we ought to strive by the grace of God not to break. There are some things that we ought to be concerned about. You know, this could be the year Jesus comes back for his church. Hmm? Hmm? Uh, wouldn't that be a blessing? Hmm? Uh, I know some of you got new homes or you're waiting to move into new homes. Uh, I'm waiting to move into my permanent home. Wouldn't that be a blessing? Hmm? Well, if he comes, like the first song we sang before Sunday school, are you watching for Jesus to come? You ought to make some vows that will keep you in a position where you are watching for him to come. I got to thinking about vows we should make and resolutions we should make that are spiritual. We should be resolved in accountability. You know, every facet of your life has to have accountability. Your marriage, your job, keeping the law when you're driving. Hmm? There's accountability in everything. But how come we think there shouldn't be accountability in the things of God? If there's one place we should never falter in accountability, it ought to be with God. And yet so many think so little of what we do for God. Can I say we ought to be accountable to the Father himself? Romans chapter number 14 verse 12 says, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. You may not be accountable in this life, but you are going to give an account to God. And you're not going to give an account to God for my life. You're going to give an account to God for your life. And I'm not going to give an account to God for your life. I'm going to give an account to God for my life. And so we should uh, be resolved to be accountable to the Father this year. We are about to be accountable to His Word. You realize we'll be judged by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. 
It's important you and I to know what God said and then to live what God said because we're going to give an account of it. Hmm? And yet, if I would have preached this morning out of Habakkuk, most of you'd had to look in the index to find out where it's at. Mm -mm. Sober. Mm -hmm. We ought to give an account of God for His will. God has a will for all of our lives. First of all, it's His will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But He has a perfect will, a plan for your life. He has something that you can do that will bring Him glory. And you ought to be accountable to abide where God wants you to be so that He gets glory from your life. We ought to be accountable for His workmanship. Do you realize that He's the potter, we're the clay, and He's doing a work in our lives that He can show us off the handiwork of God? Now think about that. You ever seen a sunset so pretty you took a picture of? That's the work of God. Do you ever look up at night and see the stars that He flung out there on nothing? That's the work of God. And people will marvel over those things. You realize that if we're accountable to Him and His workmanship, people will look at your life and marvel the same? They should. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. My dear friends, we ought to be accountable in, in our workmanship. And yield ourselves to the hand of God let Him do something miraculous in our lives and that folks would marvel at the goodness and grace of God. We ought to be accountable to the Father. We ought to be accountable to the family of God. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us, verse 19, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, uh, in whom you are also built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. You see, God fitly framed us together. We all have been placed here by Almighty God. Now, I'm not much of a builder. Brother Ray's a builder. Brother Mike's a block layer. He used to be a block layer before his knees gave out. Brother Mike, if you build a wall and you took out one of the central blocks in the middle of that thing, would it be as strong? No, it won't. You see, without you, the work of God is weakened. A chain's only as strong as its weakest link. But the house of God is only as strong as the people in it being the workmanship God would have them to be. We need to be accountable one to another. Because, Brother Clint, if you aren't doing your job, that means somebody else has to do their job and your job too. Puts a strain on it. Won't be long and the strain causes the wall to break down and crumble. We ought to be accountable to the family of God. We ought to be accountable to the Father. We ought to be accountable to the forsaken. Second mm, Corinthians 4, 3. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Do you realize that we're going to give an account of the lost people God put in our life? And if we did not witness to them and tell them how to be saved, their blood would be required at our hands. Now, you can believe what you want to believe. I really don't care. But in Revelation chapter 1, when Jesus is talking about the candlestick, I believe God's got a candlestick for every area. And I know there are churches everywhere, but I believe we're the candlestick for Florence, Kentucky. If I didn't believe that, I'd be where I thought the candlestick was. It's our responsibility to get the gospel out to this community. Our Jerusalem is Florence. Then we got Judea and Samaria. That could be Union or Burlington or Hebron. We've got to get the gospel out in our area into the other most parts of the world. We, we ought to be held accountable for that. God help us. People all around us are dying and going to hell, and we're more interested in frivolous things that don't mean anything. The fact that sinners are dying without Jesus Christ. That ought to break our hearts. That ought to break our hearts. We don't see... The church house filled 
the altars flooded with sinners calling on Jesus to be saved. Our vows or our resolutions to God this year ought to be, Lord, help me to be more accountable. I thought about this. Not only should we be resolved to be more accountable, we ought to be resolved about our attitude. One fellow said mm, several years ago that your attitude will never get higher, your altitude will never get any higher than your attitude. Some of you aren't flying high today because you got a bad attitude. Mm. Your attitude not only affects you, it affects those around you. When you bring it to church, it affects the church. Mm. We ought to be concerned about our attitudes in worship. Our attitude affects our perception in worship. In other words, you've got a bad attitude, you won't be able to receive the message. You need to be spiritually fed. And if you come to the house of God with a bad attitude, you're going to leave out hungry and your life's going to show it this week. Our attitude affects our perception, also affects our praise. You know why more people didn't act like Miss Noreen? You might have bad attitude. The Bible said, let everything and have breath. Praise the Lord. Mm -mm. Now, it's not God's will for everybody to testify. I've read 1 Corinthians 14. We all can't testify. We all can't have a song. Not every preacher in here could have a message. We'd be here all day and tomorrow. But some couldn't praise the Lord because you've got a bad attitude. Mm -mm. Can I say this? Our attitude affects our prayers. If you harbor iniquity in your heart, God will not hear you. And if you've got a bad attitude, you're full of iniquity. Hmm? Chances are you've got a bad attitude because you're bitter. You're bitter because you didn't get the G.I. Joe with the Kung Fu grip for Christmas. You've got to be old to remember that. Huh? You're just bitter. And in most people that are bitter, Brother Donald, is because they're envious. Hmm. Sister Dawn got a new car, and I'm all tore up about it. So I'm going to have a bad attitude and not worship the Lord. Uh, I'm glad she got a new car. That van she had I've had about 100,000 miles when they bought it 10 years ago. Peter's tore it apart and worked on it, worked on it, then had to take it to a mechanic, get it fixed many times. Uh, his car's got over 200,000 miles on it, so she got a new car. Hallelujah. I'm glad God blessed her. Get a new car. What a blessing. Huh? I mean, they're faithful. They're faithful to the house of God. They love the Lord. Uh, God blessed them with a new car. I say, bless the Lord. Would you get a bad attitude about that, huh? Hmm? Tony, Brandon, Tommy, and Christine are getting new homes. I say, bless the Lord. Huh? Tommy needed more room. Huh? Tony needed to get out of Erlanger. And you, if you ever seen that driveway he had, huh? What, you all been coming to church here about 10, 11 years now, huh? 12, 15, how long you been here? 17 years. Lord have mercy. I got a special crap in heaven pastoring that guy for 17 years. I'm telling you, huh? Ever since I've known him, he's talked about hoping to get out of that house. And God's blessed him. Get come to Boone County, Kentucky. What a blessing. Huh? I think it's wonderful. Huh? Now, when we moved in our house 20 years ago, I said, we ain't never moving again. We got a lot of junk. Next time I'm moving, I'm going to heaven. But I'm glad God blessed them with a new house. Well, I'm saying these things because if you're not careful, you get to looking around and you get envious. Next thing you'll get bitter, thinking, where's my blessings? Hey, the same God that blessed them can bless you, but he won't. Well, you got that bad attitude. Mm. Huh? He's promised to give you desires of your hearts as long as he gets the glory for it. 
And maybe he didn't bless you with a new car because he knew you wouldn't praise him. Hmm. Uh, but your bad attitude affects your prayer life. It also affects your peers. Mention that. You bring a bad attitude in here, it affects the service. Uh, somebody get up trying to sing and it's dead in four o'clock and their throat swells up. Preacher tries to preach uh, over your dead, uh, uh, sorry, bitter attitude. Uh, and folks that are sitting there lost can't get under conviction. Folks sitting here hurting can't get the help they need. Uh, folks sitting here looking for direction can't get direction all because of a bad attitude. You ought to pray and be resolved. I'm going to get a better attitude. Mm. Not only our attitude can concerns our worship it concerns our walk it concerns our spirituality it affects our saltiness and our light you'd be salt and light to this dark and depressed world most people in this world's never going to go to Walmart by King James Bible most people in this world's not going to turn on a preacher and listen to preaching most people in this world uh, are only going to turn to Jesus if they see Jesus in your life uh, and they see that you have what they need. Uh, but if you've got a bad attitude, they don't need that. They get enough of that. Mm -hmm. It affects our saltiness, our light, our spirituality. It affects our speech. If you've got a bad attitude, whatever's in your heart comes out your mouth. Mm hmm. It affects our worship. It affects our walk. It also affects our warfare. We're in a spiritual warfare. Our warfare is not with flesh and blood. But it's against principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. We face a sorry devil and all the imps of hell. My dear friends, you've got a bad attitude. It affects your warfare. Listen to me. You're going to face hurt in this life. You don't sign up for hurt. Nobody does. Anybody that likes pain is a masochist. We don't like pain. We don't like hurt. We all got enough scars in our life. From the hurt, the worst hurts when it's people that's close to you. Family members or church family members. If you're going to face hurt and you've got a bad attitude, that hurt will overcome you. Mm -hmm. You're going to face hardships. Mm -hmm. I'd love to be one of them, name it and claim it, live on the mountaintop all the time preachers. But I've just lived life long enough to realize that ain't so. Huh? This crowd saying that if you don't get healed because you don't have the faith, how do you answer the Apostle Paul? He could heal other people, but he had a thorn in the flesh. He couldn't heal himself. You're going to face some hardships. If you've got a bad attitude, those hardships get compounded. And I say this, you're going to face hindrances. I know you all don't believe me, but about 100 years ago, I used to run a little bit. Ran across country. Ran track. I just did that because I was bored. As you can tell, I'm not bored anymore. But one thing I know, I, I used to like long distance running. I don't know why. I don't even like long distance driving anymore. But something about when you're running, and it don't matter how much work you put in, don't matter how good a shape you're in, you run long enough, you're going to hit a wall. And that wall will either defeat you or you'll defeat the wall. And the only way you defeat the wall is by keep running. I don't know what it is. Maybe you can do an x-ray on somebody and find out. But what is it about running? You'll get a pain right here. You think you're going to give birth to a child or something. You just got to run through it. They used to say, just squeeze your upper lip and the pain will go away. No, the pain don't go away and you look stupid running with your lip, squeezing your lip. 
you just got to keep going. But you're going to face some hindrances. You're going to face some walls. You're going to face some pains that you never knew you had. You just got to keep going on for Jesus. Matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 12 gives us the answer for our bad attitudes. In verse number 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. When they were spitting on him, he counted that as joy. When they plucked his beard out, he counted that as joy. When they platted his head with a crown of thorns, he counted that as joy. When he yielded himself to that cross and they nailed him to it, he counted it as joy. Because he looked ahead and seen how it was going to affect us. See, when we face things and we realize it's all a part of God's plan, you'll count it as joy too if you realize God's going to use your life to affect somebody else. He said, For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. All the sin that would ever be committed was laid on him. He endured that. Why? So you and I could be saved. He said, it says, Consider all that Jesus went through, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. When you take your eyes off of Jesus, you'll get a bad attitude. You keep your eyes on him, you can't help but have an attitude of praise, an attitude of gratitude, an attitude of thankfulness and overwhelming, an attitude of humility. All of a sudden, everything you're going through is just a light affliction compared to what he went through. I said we ought to be resolved to be accountable. We ought to be resolved in our attitude. Last point, only three today. We ought to be resolved in applause. We should have a, a, an applause or an attitude of praise for the Savior. Hmm? We ought to praise Him with our lips, like some did today. We ought to praise Him with our lives. Folks ought to see in your life that you love Jesus Christ. Folks ought to see that you're happy to be a Christian. Folks ought to see in your life a joy that they don't understand. And we ought to have applause and praise for our Savior through our loyalty. Hmm. When folks know you belong to Him and they just see you just stick with Him regardless of what goes on in your life, you're just loyal to Jesus Christ, they know you're real. That's all the world wants to see, is that you're real. We ought to have an applause, praise for the Savior. We ought to have applause or praise for the saints of God. We ought to edify the saints of God. It's okay to tell somebody, Hey, you're a blessing to me. It's okay to tell somebody, you've encouraged me. It's okay to tell somebody, hey, I love you and I'm praying God blesses you. It's okay to edify the body of Christ. As a matter of fact, we're commanded to in the Scriptures. But the Bible says this in Romans 13, 7. Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. We ought to honor the saints of God. You ought to be thankful. Don't wait till they're gone to give them their flowers. Hmm? Let them know how much they mean to you. You never know what it'll do in their life. You ought to have applause or praise for the Savior, for the saints of God. But we ought to also have applause and praise in the midst of our storms. Hmm? Why? Preach, I'm going through it. <laughs> Why should I have applause or praise in the midst of my storm. Well, first of all, because you're not forsaken. You never go through a storm alone. Can I say secondly, because we're fit for the storm. You've been equipped. God will never let you go through a storm He's not already prepared you for. He's promised to not put more on you than you're able to bear. And we also ought to praise Him and applaud in our storms because they don't last forever. How many times in the Bible it says, and it came to pass? Huh? Didn't come to stay. Just came to pass. What a blessing, huh? Let me say this, I'll be done. Resolutions often fail because too many times they're made from an unsustainable emotion. 
And I say, in order to keep spiritual resolutions, we must put to practice verse number 8. So will I sing praise unto thy name forever, here it is, that I may daily perform my vows. If you wait till Sunday to serve God, friend, you're not going to be a very effective Christian. But if you, every day of your life, get up and put on the whole armor of God and get up and put the Word of God in your heart, get a song in your heart, talk to the Lord, I promise you, your day will be a whole lot better off than if you don't. Every day, perform your vows to God. Every day, be accountable. Every day, Make certain you have the right attitude. And every day offer the applause, the praise to God that he so richly deserves. I guarantee you, when you come to church, you'll act like that lady right there. Because you just couldn't contain it because God had been so good to you. Huh? God help us to make spiritual resolutions that affect the cause of Christ, that impact people. You know, that's why God left us here, to impact other people. And friend, there's somebody you can make a difference in their life. There's somebody in this church you can make a difference in their life. If you're willing to put Jesus first. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Maybe you need to come and thank the Lord for being so good to you. Maybe you need to come and ask the Lord to help you with some areas in your life. Maybe you're here today and you're not saved. And you know you're not saved, but you want to be saved. Why don't you come? We'll show you how to be saved. Maybe you're here tonight or this morning and God's put somebody on your heart. You want to just go and tell them thank you. Maybe God's dealt with you about something else. You just mind the Lord during this invitation. They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for your good grace. God, thank you for winking at our ignorance. There's a lot of times we've had bad attitudes. A lot of times we haven't been very accountable. Lord, there's been many times we haven't offered the praise you deserve. God, help us in these areas of our lives. God, help us, Lord, to seek to put you first. God, use us to be a light to the lost and to be a blessing to the Lord. Now, God, have your will and way in this invitation. God, if there's somebody here today not saved, I pray they'd come trust Christ. God, have your will and way now, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.